Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome from wherever you're, you're joining us. My name is Dr. Fedlin McCormack-Hale. I'm an associate professor with the School of Diplomacy and International Relations here at Seton Hall University. And on behalf of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all on this, our seventh session of the Women, Peace and Security Speaker Series on women peacemakers before and after 1325. In today's session, we are commemorating the 22nd anniversary of the adoption of Security Council Resolution 1325. It's a very important day and time. Um, and it's just a delight for us to have Ms. Christine Ahn, who will be sharing with us to commemorate this, this occasion. Uh, just a little bit about the speaker series. It was conceived by the center as a learning event on the role of peacemakers globally about 20 plus years after UN 1325. And as we all know, 1325 called for greater inclusion of women in peacemaking processes. Through this series, we seek to understand what impact 1325 has had on empowering women as meaningful mediators. And we do this through deep dive conversations with dynamic women who are pushing the boundaries in this field as they share their varied experiences with us all. And just to, to let you know, this isn't formal. We see this as a family conversation, getting to know deeply the experiences of our guest speakers, as well as sharing the collective wealth of experiences that everybody has on this call. So again, we welcome you to the series and we welcome you to this special time where it's a privilege for me particularly to moderate the conversation with Ms. Christine Ahn. And she will be providing us with a rare look at women's efforts in peace building across North and South Korea. We're looking forward to her. Let's see. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, great. Um, so we're looking forward, as I said, to listening to Ms. Ahn. But before she speaks, we have some short opening remarks from the School of Diplomacy um, and from representatives of sponsors of the event, the United Nations Association of the USA, as well as Inclusive Security. So to start our opening remarks, we have Dean Elizabeth Halpin, who is Associate Dean, as well as Associate Director of the Buccino Leadership Institute um, at Seton Hall. She's a member of the senior leadership team and, the schools, and on the school's board of advisors. She, sh she serves as Chief Officer leading design, implementation, and strategic assessment activities in the areas of external affairs, administration, strategy, and leadership. She's currently acting director of the Buccino uh, Leadership Institute, and she also serves as the school's expert on leadership development, including developing leadership programming for women's empowerment activities, student clubs and organizations, as well as student ambassador programs. She leads the school's diversity, equity, inclusion and justice initiative, advises the initiative for the uh, Buccino uh, Leadership Institute as well. She also supports the school's research centers and serves on university-wide committees. So as you can see, she has a lot on her plate. Dean Halpin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. McCormick Hill. I'm delighted to be here to represent the School of Diplomacy at Seton Hall University, and I thank you all for being with us today for our seventh session of the Women Peacemakers Before and After 1325. I thank you all for your commitment to the Women, Peace and Security agenda as we reach this 22nd anniversary of Resolution 1325. I'm encouraged by the resolve of this group uh, to reaffirm the key role that women play in peace building and the work that we are all doing to toward equal and full participation of women in, in, in peacemaking. On behalf of the school, I, I am very grateful to all of our sponsors and I look forward to what our distinguished, distinguished featured speaker and human rights activist, Ms. Christine Ahn, will contribute to our important work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dean Halpin. Next, it is a pleasure to invite, to give her opening statement, Lady T. Thompson who is the UNA Women's Co-Chair, as well as Executive Director of agrobiz.org and the founder of Cashew Queen. So Lady T is the Executive Director of Agrobiz, founder of Cashew uh, Queens and Emerging Social Enterprise. Using Thompson's She Power, ideas and causes are moved from following to followed and from obscurity to prominence. In addition to facilitating international economic development, 
Ms. Thompson facilitates U.S. and foreign investment. Among her professional advocacy responsibilities are women's self-sufficiency, equity and equality, African descendant diaspora inclusion, youth and women's empowerment, agricultural and entrepreneurial skills transfer, as well as investment matchmaking for women and minority companies. Uh, T. Thompson is a global citizen and she shapes economic growth, strategies, collaboration and implementation across sectors and continents to advance women's empowerment, living wages, human rights defenders and sustainable development goals. Thompson has also been recognized by President Obama during Women's History Month for her contributions to doing business in Africa. For her work spanning over 30 years in 14 countries, She's received many prestigious national and international awards and accolades. Her current roles include UNA USA co-chair, Women's Affinity Group and CEDAW Ad Hoc Committee, Fulbright Specialist, Human Trafficking Activist, International Chair for the National Women in Agriculture Association, and former Global Goals Ambassador for the 2020-21 United Nations Association USA. Lady T holds a Master's in Business Administration as well as a Bachelor's Degree in Legal Administration from the prestigious University of Detroit, Mercy. She lives in the Metro Detroit area with her family. Lady T, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. On behalf of the United Nations Association of the USA, I too would like to welcome everyone today and thank each of you for participating. I'd like to give a special uh, Thank you to Dean Smith, Dean um, Halpin, and Raja Tali, and everyone on the team for collaborating for this particular event. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with UNA USA, we are a grassroots movement of over 20,000 Americans who convene in 225 campus and community chapters, chapters across the U.S. We are dedicated to our mission to educate, inspire, and mobilize Americans to support the principles and vital work of the United Nations and its agencies, as well as to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. I am honored that we are partnering once again with the School of Diplomacy and International Relations on this series, which is unique because it provides direct access for women, peacemaker and security change makers who are in the field and making an actual difference in their communities. The series provides an opportunity to have real dialogues, learn from one another and exchange ideas. Furthermore, the series is a perfect alignment with the work of UNA USA. For example, as the UNA uh, Women's Affinity Group co-chair, we have a nationwide campaign of town halls that's called Ratify, Ratification to CEDAW. And we're doing that to, acceler to accelerate the Cities for CEDAW's movement that encourages state and local governments to adopt resolutions and legislation that implements the principles found in the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, a UN treaty ratified, yet ratified in the United States. Programs like Cities for CEDAWs and this Women's Peacemakers Before and After 1325 series are important because they provide a platform to elevate women's voices and advance the gender equality agenda. Therefore, I wanna thank each of you for joining us today. And I embrace and I'm looking forward to this global perspective for which we all can play a part. And I'm excited to hear Ms. Christine Ahn's talk regarding the implications of the implementation of the UN Resolution 1325 in the Korean Peninsula and follow up with the Q&A session moderated by Dr. McCormick Hall. So thank you and uh, please, if you like to join, 
or find out any information about UNA USA, you can visit us at unausa.org. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you so much, Lady T, for that welcome and, and that statement delivered beautifully. Um, it is now a pleasure to invite, and pardon me for the name, um, so please correct me, but it's my pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Mickey Yachevich. Um, who's the Vice Chair of Inclusive Security. Welcome. Um, um, Mr. Misad Mithi is Inclusive Security's Vice Chair. He has been integral to the conceptualization and the work of inclusive security since its founding in 1999. A native of Sarajevo, he attributes his inspiration to his experience supporting women peace builders working to stop the bloodshed and promote reconciliation in war-torn Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, after two decades of finding practical solutions to seemingly intractable conflicts in more than 40 regions, he leads inclusive security's effort to promote lasting systemic change around the world by developing national action plans that ensure women's leadership in peace and security affairs. Mickey has directed intensive programming in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and also managed country programs in Bosnia, Colombia, and Liberia. Before joining inclusive security, Mr. Yachovic directed the Emerging Leaders Project at the State of the World Forum and managed reintegration efforts for child soldiers at Search for Common Ground. He's a PhD candidate at George Mason University School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution and teaches at American University, Georgetown University, and the School for International Training with a special focus on transitional justice. Mr. Yachovic, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. And Lady T, I think you should run for president or something. That was so <laughs> inspiring and wonderful. And I want to thank you as a sort of new American for trying to bring the world to, to this country because ratifying CEDA, actually also working on the National Action Plan and implementing uh, the Congress actually passed WPS law. This is one of the few countries in the world that has this law, but we are so far from the implementation. So that was wonderful and terrific, uh, inspired by your words. I'm also inspired by many on this call. So thank you, Sidney Ho friends. I wanna give a special recognition for my dear friend, Raja, who, who makes us all appear in these gatherings. And, and that is really connecting the voices of these uh, great leaders like Christine, like Raja, many on, others on the call. Um, um, and I want to highlight, people often ask me, because as you hear by the bios, as you enter the, the decades of work, we've just been around the block. So people say, what is the difference before and after 1325? And I will say one thing has not changed, which is the women of my country, of Bosnia, just as Christine's people in Korea are doing, have never stopped building the bridges, even at the height of the conflict. So women were always doing this work. They were always courageously trying to cross these, uh, these real or imaginary boundaries. What has changed is efforts like this, which is we are getting, thank God, many academic institutions like Seton Hall to pay attention and to document these stories and to profile these stories and to really show the world that women's leadership on peace and security is not new. It's not unique to one region or the other. What we are still, however, lacking, and so this is when I say what is not happening, is the policymaker recognition and attention to really value this kind of work, to elevate the efforts that Christine is gonna tell us about and include it in how actually governments and multilaterals resolve these issues. So we are delighted to be here. I'm also excited to learn about North and South Korean efforts and uh, officially welcome everybody. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Vicky, um, for those words as well, and for telling us, you know, starting us on this journey and talking about what has changed and what hasn't changed. And so now it is really a distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Ms. Christine Ahn, who's the founder and executive director of Women Cross DMZ. Um, Christine Ahn is the founder and executive director of Women Cross DMZ, a global movement of women mobilizing to end the Korean War and to ensure women's leadership and peace building. In 2015, she led 30 international women peacemakers across the demilitarized zone from North Korea to South Korea. They walked with 10,000 Korean women on both sides of the DMZ 
and held Women's Peace Symposium in Pyongyang and Seoul. Anne is the international coordinator of the Korea Peace Now transnational campaign, which Women Cross DMZ launched in 2019 with three other feminist peace organizations, WILPF, Noble Women's Initiative, and Korean Women's Movement for Peace. She helped create the Feminist Peace Initiative, which Women Cross DMZ built with Madra and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance to reimagine a feminist movement driven US foreign policy. She has addressed the United Nations, the US Congress, Canadian Parliament, and the ROK National Human Rights Commission. Her op eds have appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and she's a regular contributor on MSNBC, Democracy Now, and CNN. Christine is also the co founder of the Korea Policy Institute and the Korea Peace Network, and has worked with the Global Fund for Women and the Women of Color Resource Center. Christine serves on the board of Hawaii's Peace and Justice. Hawaii Peace and Justice. She's the recipient of the 2020 US Peace Prize for her bold activism to end the Korean War, heal the wounds from the war, and women's leadership in peace building. Ahn has a master's degree in international policy from Georgetown University. As you can see, she has done a lot, and it is truly just a privilege for us to have her here. We're excited to hear your talk. A big welcome, um, Ms. Christine Ahn. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Fadlin, for that beautiful introduction. And I'm just really honored to be with all of you on this occasion. Um, I, yeah, I'm just very touched that you've invited me and to be with um, so many of you amazing leaders who have been championing this issue for so long. Um, I would like to spend the first Part of my talk, uh, introducing you to the transnational feminist movement for peace in Korea and some of the strategies that we use. And then I'll end my presentation with a short clip of a new documentary film by Diane Borche Lim called Crossings, um, which is actually going to screen in Palo Alto at the UN Association Film Festival. So Lady T, thank you and your association for including it. Um, and then I would like to share some closing thoughts on UNSCR 1325 and the challenges we face as a movement. Um, so Maria, you're gonna have to help me with um, the slideshow. So um, let's begin. So um, tell me when you're ready. I guess maybe full screen if it's possible. Yes, Christine, ready. Okay, so this is uh, our image when we crossed the DMZ from North to South Korea in 2015. Next slide. Um, for those of you that may or may not know, the Korean War is actually the US's oldest conflict. The Korean War lasted from 1950 to 53, but it only ended with a ceasefire. Um, an armistice agreement that was signed by the US, North Korea, China. Um, South Korea did not sign, but the US signed on its behalf. But 4 million people were killed in that conflict. This is a picture from Pyongyang, um, where the US actually waged a pretty indiscriminate bombing campaign. 80% of North Korean cities were totally destroyed. Next slide. So the armistice was signed, but you can see the demilitarized zone uh, across the 38th parallel uh, that has remained in place. And so that has meant that uh, a militarized border, uh, 150 miles across, two miles wide, um, is kind of cleaving the Korean Peninsula and the people cannot cross that uh, DMZ. Um, there's 1.2 million landmines and it's um, probably the most militarized border in the world. Next slide. So on the 70th anniversary of Korea's division by Cold War powers, Koreans had no say in the division. Um, the US basically uh, to uh, Defense Department officials uh, tore a page from the National Ge Geographic, drew a line across the 38th parallel, sent a memo, Truman sent a memo to Stalin to say you could have North, of that 38th parallel and the US will have South. So there was a military government on both sides for several years 
And then uh, the two countries, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was established in the North and the Republic of Korea established in the South. But basically on the 70th anniversary of Korea's division by these Cold War powers, the former Soviet Union and the US, we decided we needed to bring attention to this division, the insanity of it, um, the inhumanity of it, and call for a formal end to the Korean War. So that's what we set out to do. Next slide. And so here we are, we traveled first to Pyongyang from Beijing, and we met with approximately 250 North Korean women. Um, this is at a peace symposium with them. And um, at the end of this slideshow, we'll show a short clip of one of the North Korean women sharing her story of surviving the Korean War. Next slide. These are some of the images of our peace walk. We walked with 5,000 North Korean women um, across uh, the streets of Pyongyang. On the upper left is uh, the reunification tower. It's on the edge of Pyongyang. We marched with them. And then we took a bus, went to Kaesong, which is this ancient city that is right at the border of the DMZ. That's in the bottom left. And then on the upper right is actually an image of a North Korean woman who probably was uh, born in Korea before it was divided. And she was cheering and with tears in her eyes, um, you know, calling for the reunification of Korea. And then on the bottom right is when we crossed into South Korea. This is in Paju and you can see the barbed wire fences and just how militarized this region is. Next slide. And so what we've been doing ever since is we've been trying to convene women peacemakers from North Korea, South Korea, but also throughout the region, um, China, Russia, Japan, um, and obviously the United States, given the historic role that the U.S. plays. And so this picture on the left is of us meeting in Bali and on the upper right is in 2018 when we um, gathered for uh, the summits that were taking place to support um, the peace process and call for women's inclusion. And the bottom right is a meeting that took place in, Can uh, in Beijing, actually the Canada Canadian Embassy. Um, but you can see Bonnie Jenkins, the Under Secretary of State now in the Biden administration, and Jackie O'Neill, who was formerly with Inclusive Security and now is the first women peace and security ambassador. But we had women from North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Russia, China, obviously, um, the United States and Canada. Next slide. And so since then, in 2019, we decided we needed to launch a transnational feminist campaign calling for Korea Peace Now. And so we did with the Nobel Women's Initiative, with WILP and a coalition of South Korean women's groups. We started by going to Washington, D.C., meeting, bringing South Korean women parliamentarians to also meet with U.S. Congresswomen such as Barbara Lee and Jan Schakowsky. And so... Um, that has set us off on this campaign to end the Korean War. Next slide. And so part of what we do is we engage. We engage with uh, the uh, officials, senior officials from all governments. So we've met, we did meet with the Trump administration. We have met with the South Korean administration and even with uh, members of the National Peace Committee from North Korea. And I'm slated to go meet the State Department finally. I think since we are transitioning from COVID, there's now an opportunity for more face-to-face -face meetings. Next slide. Um, we do, we believe uh, as women peacemakers, it's important to change the narrative. So we have um, been producing op-eds. We try to, um, you know, put forth a, gendered perspective on this oldest conflict. Next slide. And we produce reports. So um, in 2019, we released a report called the Human Costs and Gendered Impact of Sanctions on North Korea. Next slide. We um, have been engaging with the UN Special Rapporteur Thomas Quintana, now it's a new one. The first one, actually, uh, a female, Elizabeth Simon. And uh, I'm excited to be working with her office as well. She is going to focus on women and children. So that is very exciting. Um, but here's Thomas Quintana, who we worked with during his tenure. And he really 
um, evolved and really understood the importance of sanctions as a, a major obstacle in advancing peace, but also human rights. But he made the link between peace and human rights. Next slide. And we produced a report called Path to Peace, the Case for a Peace Agreement to End the Korean War, where we outline all the issues that are used as obstacles towards um, formalizing a peace with North Korea. So we, uh, we address issues such as US ROK exercises, denuclearization, human rights. Um, next slide. And um, I think, you know, what we all understand is that women have to be involved in the peace process to be successful. I don't need to go over these notes. Everybody knows this. So next slide. Um, but what I do really appreciate is we often focus on women's inclusion at the official peace talks. And I absolutely think that is necessary, but just as much is the role of women peace activists and peace organizations because our involvement, our activism, our mobilization is building the political will for peace. We are helping to legitimize the formal peace process among the public. And there was a great Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security report in 2020 that um, helps make the case. Next slide. And so that's what we've been doing. And here's Joe Cirincioni, the former president of the Plowshares Fund, who said, women cross TMZ have convincingly demonstrated that we cannot end North Korea's nuclear program without a comprehensive peace. Next slide. And just today, actually, we released a, a new report called US-China Competition and the Korean Peninsula from Confrontation to peace building. As many of you may have been tracking, um, the Biden administration announced in its national security strategy that China is the greatest challenge and threat to the US. Um, and China just wrapped up its Workers Party Congress over the weekend. And so we have a very dangerous situation and um, it is creating the massive militarization throughout the Pacific and Asia and the fault line is Korea, which as you may recall in the earlier part of my presentation, the US and China were signatories to the armistice. This Korean war was the first war that US and Chinese troops fought each other. In fact, Mao Zedong's son served and died in the Korean war. So here we have an unresolved conflict that is now festering um, and, it, you know, Yes, it's a dangerous situation, but it is also an opportunity for potential co cooperation and that for to succeed, as we all say, is must include women. Next slide. And so one strategy that we've been using is building grassroots political power and putting pressure on the arm of the US government that we have the greatest access to, and that is the US Congress. So uh, in the last Congress, we helped work with Ro Khanna, a progressive representative from California to introduce House Resolution 152, calling for an end to the Korean War. Well, in this Congress, we actually got Brad Sherman, who is on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and a National Security Democrat to introduce HR 3446, which has more meat and power than just a resolution. And currently we have 45 co-sponsors. Our goal is to meet the 52. And that's where we could use all of your help. Next slide. And so how we do this is we have 10 chapters across the country. Um, and we have uh, caucuses, youth caucuses, Korean language caucuses, Christian caucuses. And now we have started um, campus chapters all across the country. So they have started at the University of Hawaii, at University of California, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, Spelman College, Boston College. And so uh, we're hoping to continue to launch because we believe in the importance of uh, cultivating the leadership of young people. Next slide. And so this is just a snapshot of our community and um, and things that we do. It's multi-generational. They write op-eds, they organize town halls, they uh, lobby their members of Congress. Next slide. 
And, you know, in the pandemic, this is what we had to resort to. But this is a, a screenshot of us um, at one of our lobby visits with Senator Hirono's office. Next slide. And uh, as you mentioned earlier in my intro, um, we started the Feminist Peace Initiative, which is uh, a collaboration between Women Cross CMC, Madre, and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. And the, the goal of this initiative is to have a movement-driven U.S. foreign policy. It's about doing what all of you do, especially members of the diaspora community who understand the, comp the consequences of U.S. militarism and war and the need for the United States to have a different role in the international community, one from aggression and dominance towards cooperation. And, um, and so uh, I could talk more about that later. Next slide. And so just to wrap up this section of my presentation before I go into some reflections about where we are today, um, the uh, another big tool that we're using is um, this new film called Crossings, which we hope you'll invite us to bring to your communities, your campuses. But uh, Forbes says it is an inspiring film about activism. It tracks our, our 2015 crossing and the subsequent movement that we've built um, especially a grassroots people movement led by women. And uh, it's screening this uh, weekend at the Palo Alto Film Festival near Stanford. So that's very exciting. And so now I'm gonna let Maria just show a quick clip and uh, I'll just wrap up my presentation with just a few remarks. So Maria. As she gets ready, just uh, the clip I'm about to share is from the film. It's during the Women's Peace Symposium in Pyongyang. And, um, you know, rarely do we get to see or hear North Korean women. Um, oftentimes it's the voices of defectors, which I could discuss later. It has a certain, sometimes those who have a platform have a certain agenda. But it, uh, I think it's rare to actually um, see and hear survivors of the Korean War and the consequences today of this unresolved war. So thank you. Oh, Maria, I don't know, for some reason I can't hear. I think it's because you're on mute. I apologize, I'm checking the audio now. Okay, technological feat. <laughs> yes, I apologies, working on it. And if it helps, Maria, do you want me to? Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So apologies, and I'll, I'll restart the video again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Christine. We're working through technology. Thank you all for sticking with us. Chongjing시계이두두손모두 저는 오늘 여성들이 모인 이 자리에서 정의의 양심 앞에 허소합니다. 가장 고통과 가슴 아플 것은 우리 어머니들과 
아이들이라고 하게 되는 이 세상의 전쟁이 전쟁을 맞고 감사합니다. Thank you, Maria. And um, I'm just going to now just close with a few quick remarks about the meaning today of um, 1325 and some of the challenges that we face. So as we know, the 1325 um, agenda, the Women, Peace and Security agenda has existed for two decades. And also at the same time, um, you know, the reconciliation and peace efforts on the Korean Peninsula have also um, coincided with tw this 20 year agenda. Um, I think we could all agree that uh, the women, peace and security agenda is the most significant global framework, which injects gender perspectives in the areas of peace and security. And it was made possible by many of you and other longtime women peace builders who have been calling for women's inclusion. Um, the reconciliation efforts, though, in Korea, I think, um, you know, even though they now have a national action plan, um, it, uh, it, you know, continues to be highly constrained um, by the other interests, the national security interests. And so I think that's the kind of the the area where we kind of fall short as a women peace and security movement is that um, our calls for peace are all ca our calls for women's inclusion um, our calls for even like sophisticated intelligent ways in the in the case of the us and north korea we have been so stuck on a denuclearization first approach um, that uh, has not moved anything. It has not led to denuclearization. It has not led to improved human rights. And so even though we call for a peace first approach um, and a new way, we continue to be sidelined or, um, you know, to be called naive. And I think that is a real challenge because the, um, the framework in which we're operating kind of is always such that uh, national security always dominates um, what we would call as genuine human security and the need for a more holistic approach of what how we define security. Um, and uh, I feel like uh, while there is also such excitement about feminist foreign policies, I believe now there's 12 in the world, um, as we saw in Sweden, um, there's, we're just subject too vulnerable to the political whims of the day. 
and uh, will always take a back seat to national security. And as we know, many of the foreign policy frameworks do not actually look critically at militarism. And, um, and we really need to do more work in that, in that vein. Um, lastly, Women Crest TMZ has been able to grow our organization and our capacity due to the um, incredible generosity investments of individual donors who have donated their time, their talent, and their treasures, and to a handful of foundations who believe in the importance of investing in women's leadership on this conflict, this most longest US conflict. But the amount of money invested in women's peace building is a drop in the bucket compared with think tanks and academic institutions that do research on North Korea's satellite systems. I take, for example, um, I'm not gonna name the foundation, but it is named after a robber baron whose mission is to create a more secure, peaceful and prosperous world with a focus on averting the spread or use of nuclear weapons. Well, this said foundation in 2019, they supported 231 organizations, including the president and fellows of Harvard, Rand Corporation, Council on Foreign Relations, Aspen Institute and Middlebury College. I'm sorry, but investing um, in a team of researchers using satellite imagery to study North Korea's missile systems won't remove the threat of nuclear war. What will is engagement, dialogue, understanding, and peace building. And yet the majority of funding goes to North Korea watchers, largely white men with PhDs in international relations trained in grand strategy with an extractivist paradigm and an American exceptionalist worldview. So putting forth a new vision requires new thinking and bold action, it requires new voices, particularly those who've been most impacted by war and militarism and those who must understand the nature of the problem. And this necessitates a fundamental shift in who we see as experts and not replicate the white supremacy that we seek to end. Um, we can all do this and especially philanthropy that can work to center the voices of communities most impacted by war and militarism and who are on the front lines of shaping policy and discourse. So those are some of my thoughts. Um, on this, and I, I know that it probably um, touched on a lot of things that many of you are thinking about. And and um, and so I know now we have time for some conversation. So I'll leave it at there. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share the important work of um, women peace builders helping to advance peace on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, we can take a moment just to, to digest that. That was so powerful, um, so inspiring and so moving. Just, you know, the video and, and having the opportunity to listen, as you said, to voices that you don't hear, to women that have been impacted directly by the separation is just, um, it's just touching, real touching, but it, 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 it really, um, affected me. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, truly. Your, so many things came up out in your talk. So many key important issues. Um, for me, I think what really struck out was this idea of making sense of the voices of those that are affected, of those that are at the front lines, and, and having them be involved in the discussions and the narrative of what needs to be done, rather than um, privileging the same voices. You know, we've been talking a lot in international relations, especially with Black Lives Matter movement, there's, we, there's been a lot of discussion about bringing other voices to the table and opening the debate and making sure that the voices of the marginalized are represented. And your talk, I think, did a, a great job in showing that not, this notwithstanding, we still have an erasure of many of those voices. And, and, um, and we can talk about this, but how do we move beyond that? How do we make sure that the peace and security agenda widens the conceptualization of human security and moves it beyond national security, which, which really is the crux of the discourse right now. Um, so I want to open up the floor. This is, <laughs> this is the time for everybody else to, to talk. So please, if you have questions, if you have comments, um, if you, anything at all that you would like to ask Christine, this is the time. Uh, please just raise your hand and I will, um, 
come to you. So I see M um, Fatima. Please, Fatima, go ahead and ask your question. And then I also see, I think it's Audrey. So first, uh, Fatima, and then after Fatima, can Audrey ask the question? Thank you. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask why why do you think it went after all these years and decades, uh, even though we had so many genocides and wars, we still haven't learned our lessons. We humans, we still haven't learned our lessons that wars and genocides in the end of the day, they, they don't really do any good to anyone. I, I remember I read one of your work um, on Washington Post and it was about how there's so much funding that goes to wars. And this funding does, is not only just affecting foreign countries like Cor uh, North Korea, it's also affecting um, Americans. We could have better health care, we could have better education, but here we are, we're still, we love to talk about Holocaust, but I think we're, we're still stuck and we still haven't learned our lessons. Christine, you're on mute. Um, Iman, thank you so much. Uh, that is just so poignant and spot on. And I think that's why we felt the need to start the Feminist Peace Initiative, because uh, in many ways, the peace movement um, is old, it is aging, it uh, has not uh, built the kind of grassroots power. I think we have to um, really democratize the process of shaping foreign policy. I am so, I think, you know, inspired by the movement for Black Lives, um, the movement to hold police brutality accountable. Um, I think that there is so much uh, domestic mobilizing, but we will never get access to the things that we need, whether it's uh, a decent healthcare system, housing, education, um, resources to really address climate change um, unless we join forces and break down the binary that exists between domestic and foreign policy because they're so interconnected and uh you know if you look at the work of the cost of war project you know i just think my god we were um where was the women peace and security movement you know in during the pandemic you know um we had a situation where we were at the 20th anniversary of the war on terror, and we saw the million, a million people who were killed as a result of that US-led war. Uh, the millions of people that have been displaced, the trillions of dollars that have been wasted, right, in that in that 20-year war. And instead of learning from those lessons, and then in a moment where we were in a pandemic when we realize we don't even have PPE, we don't even have testing kits, we don't even have just the basics to kind of track and contain coronavirus. And instead, why are we investing so much in militarized security? And I think that's where we have a, a real fundamental blockage in who is in the process of shaping US foreign policy. We do not need to have 800 military bases around the world. We do not need to spend over $800 billion on the Pentagon budget. And we have to look at what the consequences of that militarization, of that training um, uh, uh, an armed force to use violence to resolve conflict. How does that come home to roost? How is the mass shootings in our country related to uh, the massive militarization of our society. I think these are all, all fundamental questions. And the more we can be involved in, in talking about it, especially those of us that are part of the diaspora that know the consequences of what U.S. endless war has done. I mean, if you look at David Vine's book, The United States of War, um, he says the, you know, the U.S. since its inception in 1776 has been at war for all but 11 years. And that probably in those 11 years included genocide of Native Americans. So I just think we need to have a reckoning. Um, and part of that is um, our role, especially as women, especially as women of color, um, to help kind of chart a different uh, United States for the world and for us at home. Woo! 
I need to hang out with Lady T. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. But anyway, I need you all to join us with the Feminist Peace Initiative. You know, we're just getting started and we would love um, all of you to somehow be a part of it. Uh, And thanks for that question as well, Iman. So we have another question from Audrey. Audrey, please go ahead. And then we have a couple of questions that came from online, and I'll ask those after. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for your comments um, and your presentation, Ms. An, and aloha. I'm also from Hawaii. Uh, So it's good to see you on this program. Um, to the ex- I wanted to ask you, you have talked about the U.S. national security interests, and I'd like you to comment on to what extent is China's North security interest and strategy also reinforcing this divide? Um, Audrey, I, 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 oh, somehow there's an echo, so you might have to go on mute. But before you do, I wanted to ask you just a clarifying question. Do you mean a North uh, China's strategy vis-a-vis the Korean Peninsula? Yes. Okay. And North Great. Korea, uh, you know, as well. The peninsula as a whole and North Korea as well. Uh huh. Well, um, I would say that China uh, has actually, in its um, statements, um, especially around the end of war declaration, has been quite supportive of uh, a, a peace settlement. And um, I think when Moon Jae-in, the the previous South Korean president, who really made peace with North Korea its singular foreign policy platform, um, you know, went around to the United States and to China to support um, an end of war declaration. China was right there. I think that China, um, the we are in a situation where China. Uh, would obviously not want to have a uh, unified Korean peninsula that is allied with the U.S. right along its border, which is the reason why it fundamentally went to war in the Korean War in 1950. Um, But I would say that if there's an opportunity for there to be a kind of neutral place that the Korean peninsula could play, if the formal war ended, if the war formally ended and uh, there was peaceful coexistence, not uh, one side uh, absorbing the other, as the case of Germany, um, and there was some kind of peaceful coexistence, but yet a commitment to neutrality, as we see in Europe, like with Switzerland. I I, I think that that would be the ultimate goal for Um, the Korean Peninsula to kind of play a neutral. Obviously, we are a far ways away from that, but um, the argument that we make is that um, we have to first end the war. And right now, if I could be frank, the key obstacle to advancing that is the United States. Um, The United States, you know, I think for all of the Biden administration's talk that they're ready to meet and talk anytime with North Korea, um, you know, we are, the U.S. government is the one that uh, resumed military exercises. Now they include trilateral military exercises with Japan, South Korea. We sent the USS George Washington, a nuclear aircraft carrier. We've installed uh, THAAD missile defense systems on South Korean land um, to project power and surveil China. Uh, We have 300 bases uh, encircling China. So I think, you know, uh, we can tend to look at China as the aggressor in this. And without doubt, without fail, I think all of the countries, especially in the South Asia Pacific, um, feel China's growing military might and presence. Um, especially around Taiwan and the Taiwan Straits. But what can we do to kind of tamp that down and uh, kind of tamp back the provocative rhetoric and obviously the military actions? Um, And so, yeah, I think that, you know, in our last meeting with the women from Japan, Russia, China, 
um, North and South Korea in Beijing, um, we came up with a collective statement and we all fundamentally agree that ending the Korean War would help reverse this massive militarization that is taking place throughout the whole Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that question and that response. Uh, so I'm going to take a question now that came when people signed up, they, they signed, they had questions. And this question is from Miriam Narcisse from Haiti Adolescent Girls Network. And she asks, what is the level and outcome of the engagement and participation of adolescent girls and young women in peace building efforts? On the Korean Peninsula? It is very yes, exactly. um, low. It is low, but um, according to something that I read from the UN Department of Peace and Political, what is the UNDPPA? Um, they issued a report in 2019 because they had a um, Northeast Asia Women Peace and Security Summit. And uh, there was um, some exciting developments of youth participation in, um, in the peace process. And so it seems like um, there is kind of that convergence similarly to uh, Northeast Asia women converging, that there is youth convergence. And I hope that we can continue to foster that development, but it it does seem like it's starting to take shape. And I could um, I could track down the one of the key organizers um, who was at that meeting organized by the UNDPPA. If you know whoever is asking would like to get connected with that group. Okay, great. Thank you. I know this is an, we will be recording this, so even if she's not on, she'll be able to have this and then we okay. to reach out possibly afterwards. <laughs> Raja, I see your hand up. So um, please, Raja. Yeah, so thank you so much. You. Thank you so much, Ferdinand, for moderating the session. And Christina, it's always a pleasure and like very inspiring to hear you talking about like the achievement that you've done so far. And I know even though it's very challenging and it's very important, especially for like women around the world who are like in a conflict area to hear you like take, take what you've done so far and like also see the different challenges that you have faced and, and you are still facing actually in really calling for peace. But I want to ask you, uh, because this is something like I struggle with, with the Syrian context. Like when you say peace first, can we be thinking more about like peace and justice framework, integrated peace and justice framework? You know, maybe I can give like by a little bit background of my questions, like with Syria, like I, I've been working since the Syrian revolution in 2011 in promoting and like strengthening civil society in Syria. And since two years, I see it like even three years, I see it, it's more fragmented because like some civil society are focusing a lot on peace building, like on the local level and also on the national level. While other are saying that like without justice, no peace. So we should be achieving more justice for the victims and, uh, and also like for the family of the victim, especially the detainees issue in Syria. Like uh, there are like hundreds of thousands of people are still waiting to know where their loved ones and also like many people are like subjected to torture in the Syrian um, government prison. So like, what do you say about this argument? Like within Syria, we are calling actually for more integrated peace and justice framework to move forward. But also, I, as I said, like there are people who are calling no for more peace first or more justice first. So I would like to hear your um, take on this. Thank you. Oh, well, Raja, I think that everybody who was on this call 
probably struggles with the very same issue. And so um, I don't know if I have a brilliant response, but here's a little bit of my own internal grappling with this issue. So there is, uh, has been kind of a historic split in the left or in the peace movement, in, especially in South Korea. Um, but this is obviously affects the whole diaspora. And it's, uh, there have been two lines. One is called the People's Development Line, which is more about development and justice. And then the um, National Liberation Line, which is like, we need to have uh, foreign forces out of the Korean Peninsula. It should be one country. That's what we should see. Um, I think that that conversation, which is very old, um, has probably evolved and, and changed so much because it's so complicated by globalization. Um, but I would say that maybe I tend towards um, that peace is actually the pathway to realizing justice or peace is the pathway to realizing human rights. Because as we know, when there is a war, when there is active fighting and conflict, the national security state takes over. And there is, uh, and many times it is, uh, uh, can be under dictatorship. It could be under um, very uh, um, authoritarian conditions. And so right now in, in on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea is under authoritarian condition and South Korea is under a democratic system. But when there have been conservative presidents in power or even liberal ones, what always exists in South Korea is the national security law. So anybody that uh, wants to engage with North Korea, wants to be uh, reading, uh, text from North Korea, watching North Korean films or something, um, are subject to the national security law. And obviously a similar law exists in North Korea. Anybody who is reading about South Korea. So it really, I think, constrains the political space for there to be organizing, for there to be civil society to flourish under this repressive um, context where under the state of war, really um, reduces that. And I'm not sure if that's this, the, you know, obviously that must be part of the situation in Syria. Um, but I, I think about my colleague, um, Susie Kim, who is a professor at Rutgers. She uh, wrote a book about the North Korean revolution. And I think what's so important about her analysis is she read through all the archival notes um, because some somebody somebody's somebody's thing is a little bit okay. Can you hear me can still? Put on mute, everybody, please. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Can you okay. on mute if they're not? Speaking? Well, I think this is Thank you. this is a very important point um, about Susie's analysis, which is uh, during the Korean War. Um, or before the Korean War, when, you know, the Koreas were divided and the two separate states were forming, Kim Il-sung, um, who is the founder of North Korea, you know, he used to be an independence fighter. And so he was like working with the guerrilla movements to try to overthrow the Japanese colonizers. And so that's like how he earned his uh, political chops to become the leader of North Korea, which, you know, the Soviets put him into power. But he... Uh, you know, her, she, in Susie's research, she, there were all these people's committees that were formed in South Korea, in North Korea, you know, they were working for their liberation and their independence. But when the threat of war, uh, when it seemed that South Korea was going to cross the 38th parallel and that war was uh, imminent, uh, that's when Kim Il-sung and the North Korean leadership started to crack down on any kind of democratic. And I think that was a critical moment when you saw a, a society that had the potential to be a socialist good system kind of veered to becoming an authoritarian one. And I think that's a really good example of like basically the mindset that is the North Korean mindset that has been at war for 70 years, is closed off from the rest of the world, is so paranoid 
um, having experienced the trauma that they did during the Korean War, um, and that we have to break out of that stalemate somehow. And uh, and that so yes, I guess you know, I guess from my my perspective and from seeing um, the consequences of this unresolved war, that we have to. I, I'm not saying peace with justice can't go hand in hand, but we have to really prioritize a formal end of the war. Otherwise, the uh, militarization and the close, the national security state will always dominate and justify repression or the investment of, of so much in the preparation for war. Does that make sense? Rasha, did you want to say something? She's on, on mute. mute Rasha. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Thank you so much, Christina, for like be, bringing your perspective. Like, but also there is this argument, which I, I think like I go with your perspective. I think like if we are able to get to the integrated peace and justice framework, this is would be very, very good. But if we have to choose between us, peace and justice, which one goes first, I think peace could be able to establish the uh, justice mechanism. It's so people and uh, like Syrian people in our case or in other countries are feeling uh, there is mechanism in order to achieve justice. But oh, there's it, one thing yeah. that I want to share with you like with this argument that people are saying, how do we know if dictators are not using peace as a tool in order to take over an, or continue ruling the country? So this is like another thing that I want to share with you. If, and I know that this is like argument in many conflict there, in countries around the world. Oh, yeah. But Raja, I feel like that's why we call for the women, peace and security framework. That's why we call for civil society inclusion, because peace just at the nation state level among the, the, the political leaders is not going to be a sustainable peace. We have to be involved. And so when we are a part of shaping and crafting whatever formal resolution, that is why the process is so important. And so I think that is where we can ensure that reparations or gender justice is always included in whatever peace settlement. But I hear you about the dictatorship thing, you know? Um, yeah, and I, and I think that's uh, part of the challenge that we, especially those of us that are working on conflicts within the US or in the West or other countries that, uh, you know, um, are working on conflicts that are cast uh, as just authoritarian states by uh, those of us in the West, because somehow it doesn't and allow for a more nuanced discussion. Of course, we know Syria is under authoritarian leadership. Of course, North Korea is. Of course, China doesn't, you know, the Communist Party. But, uh, and I don't think you can say they're all the same. I mean, there's like a huge range um, and historic differences that culminated in whichever government is in power. Um, but I think that somehow, um, as I've seen, in the Russia Ukraine, mm -hmm. the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, that um, the civil so society space closes down. It's just like, you know, yeah. um, you may want to provide a more historical context. Oh, only if, uh, if the United States did not push NATO along the Russia's borders, or, you know, mm -hmm. I just feel like the space just closes down so much. And so I think that is also a reason why it's so important for the women peace builders to call for the you know where is the women peace builders in this discussion and i i think that that is so central uh, when a war hits we have 20 years of experience now calling for women's inclusion in the peace process but nobody 
has been doing that on the national or international level. And I think that is a, a, a moment right now. Right. Well, thank you, Raja. Thank you, Christine. Um, I think first, just for the, the detailed response in terms of the police versus justice, which is such a big debate, as you know. So the way in which you unpacked it to show some of the, the more complicated layers underneath it, um, I think is really helpful. And then your, your other point just now about how we've been doing this, doing this for years, calling for more women. We, we know that women do these things differently. We know that women are important. And yet it seems to be limited to the quote unquote grassroots and not translating, as we said, to the national level, even to the point of attacking or addressing these national security issues that remain tatamount on the agenda. Um, so thank you for, the, for that response. Uh, there's a couple of um, hands up. And let, before I go to the who have their hands up, maybe T had a comment that she had made in the chat. Um, maybe T, I don't know if you want to say it. Yeah. Um, she said we need more female. Yeah, can you say it, please? Yeah, I just I said, you know. It. I'm so honored and privileged to be here with you. OMG, Christine, I am here. You have my allyship and my solidarity because we need more women who are peacekeepers, peace builders, or peace negotiators. And we have to bring up this generation that is having so much deprivation and suffering and guide them to listen. It's your time to arrive at this table. So it's important to say that. And then I, I'm looking at, I'm listening and hearing all of the complexities as to why the context of allyship is important for all of us because conflict has no boundaries, conflict has no color, conflict has no tribe, it has no climate. Uh, exert, uh, um, exclusions. And so it's in dialogues like today that is really paramount so that we can encourage each other and build the allyship for women. And we can't leave out our men, our male allies who are helping us along the way, but we really have to keep the solidarity of the allyship moving because we suffer when there are high level debates at the table, it's the women and children, and it boils down to hunger. When you have any level of conflict, and we're seeing it because there's no short list of conflicts right now, and looking at the, the lighthouse that was in Afghanistan and looking at the 24 million people that are at starving, we have um, um, crises or emergency levels with food. So now you're going from feeding the W, this isn't my information, the W, uh, the w World Food Program. They, they're going from feeding hungry people to, okay, we have to feed starving people. So it's in these dialogues that it's necessary for us to do better and continue to get louder and let our voices amplify for uh, peacemaking uh, globally. And so that's my two cents of the day. <laughs> Thank you for those two cents, Ms. T. Um, so, Christine, if you want to respond, uh, I'll ask a question and you can come in. And please, everybody, you don't have to have just questions. If there are comments, if there are things that you found particularly intriguing or something that you want to hear more about, please also you can either drop that in the chat or raise your hand and um, come on in and, and join the conversation. Mickey, you had your hand up. So please, Mickey, can you ask your question? Uh, yes, I mean, I was going back and forth because partly, Christine, I, I agree with you sort of where is the movement and I know movement showed up quite extensively multiracial, multi to, to your uh, crossing the border, but in a sense, I, I do still think the bigger question is 
where are the policymakers to receive the movement? Because the Afghan women were telling us a year before Taliban took Kabul, they're coming. And nobody was paying attention to that. They were not included in the discussions. Similarly, Raja knows about Syria. And so uh, it's more about then for me, not that the movement is not clear, eloquent, maybe not as you, but m many are, as, as you know, around the world. So the question I have is more the question of accountability. And I see you had a few pictures with some of the Congress, mostly women, but in, in the case of the US, sort of even when you spoke about the big challenges, like, well, we are focused on the national security strategy. Well, if the national security strategy was smart, it would recognize all that you're talking about. These are not the worst. WPS Act actually demands that the national security strategy reflects WPS principles. And but all of these commitments don't get implemented, right? It's the question of how do we hold them accountable? So when you come to DC, how are you, in addition to the State Department, hopefully going to tell Congress people this is their job to implement this? Um, it's great. And I'm so glad that there is a Women, Peace and Security Working Group that uh, has been pressuring Congress. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, because um, it kind of goes back to the larger challenge that we face, which is um, how do we, how do we take on the military industrial complex? You know, and I think that is a question that we, all must grapple with because um, when I look at the Korea situation and, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years and, you know, I, I also see in 2010 on the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, we were able to get two members of Congress to support peace with North Korea, not even a peace agreement. That was Dennis Kucinich and Barbara Lee. Who is we all know who Barbara Lee is, the only woman that voted against the U.S. Um, war on Afghanistan. So we see now, ten years more than ten years later, we now have almost fifty Korea peace champions who are calling for peace with North Korea and a peace agreement, and that takes grassroots mobilization to do that. But we are constantly constrained, right? And I think about Barbara Lee, who probably is of all of our congressional um, champions, the um, one that gets it the most, right? And she voted to not go to war in Afghanistan because of her father. He fought in the Korean War. He told her there is nobody that wins in a war. And so she took his wisdom and sat in that chapel before she went into the vote. And uh, I just think, uh, you know, she said when uh, they were trying to introduce the feminist foreign policy resolution, um, I believe it was, I, it's a, probably in this session, but she talked about how challenging it is to actually move progressive foreign policies in Congress because there is not the constituency. When you have a, uh, you know, reducing the, the college debt, you will have a domestic constituency when you have, um, uh, you know, uh, access to Medicare or something like that. At least you have some domestic constituency, but somehow we don't have not built that domestic constituency. And I really laud and am deeply indebted to the women's peace and security movement, but we have not built enough grassroots power. Um, and, you know, that is because there is very little I'm not saying that we need funding to actually put boots on the ground and build grassroots power. I, I think that that is a failed strategy, but we also do need resources, right? And um, that was kind of my point, which is where, you know, where is the funding? Where is the support to actually build the architecture and invest in an actual movement? And we need, we're, we're going to need to do that. We're going to need to try to, again, break down those binary that exists between, because I think about climate right now. And I what one thing that is very exciting to me about the climate change movement is the growing um, movements that 
are calling for the accountability of the U.S. military. Because, you know, you could, they go to these talks and the U.S. military, which has is the biggest emitter of emissions, you know, right here in Hawaii, where uh, the U.S. Navy uh, has like millions of gallons of jet fuel stored in the tanks in the water that is leaking and contaminating the aquifer that 77 percent of the island's residents depend on for our survival. That is crazy to me. Um, but somehow that is not included in the agenda of the climate change activists. So I think we slowly uh, are infiltrating and moving and the discourse, but somehow we need to build more formidable power and have a real ground game that is advocacy strategy and a grassroots organizing strategy. And uh, I know that sounds daunting, but many of you have been doing the work. And I just think, you know, it's great for us to be gathering, uh, you know, virtually like this, but how do we actually have a real meeting, a strategy meeting where we could actually pull all of our resources together and really think through a strategy that um, really can push members of Congress? I think, you know, we are, we are, we are running out of time. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you have children and grandchildren, but it is a daunting world for our children. And uh, if we don't act now, I have really fear the worst. That's so depressing. Let's mm -hmm. have a more happy, let's mm -hmm. have a more Chilly. happy ending. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. It's, it's chilling. It's depressing, but it's truth. And I think what's important about what you're doing and the work of many of the people on this call is that even if that's the truth, we can change it and working to see how we can change it and what we can do to stop this trajectory. It's not inevitable. It takes people with passion. It takes people with courage. You know, all the things that you've exhibited, all the things um, that have been discussed here. This can happen. And so it's it's depressing, but it's not the, it's not the last word. Um, <laughs> so I just <laughs> I would like to invite Maria. Maria has had her hand up to so Maria. Please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fredline, and thank you very much, uh, Christine. Uh, like we have really enjoyed your all the conversation and all the experiences that you shared. Um, I, now that you just mentioned children, I, that was one of my points as, as we were going through throughout the conversation. And I think, I mean, we definitely need to act now, and that involves advocacy and just strengthening and just increasing um, the amount of grassroots movements. However, I think at some point we have also failed in the way we are educating children. Because then, for, for instance, like I, I have spoken to teenagers, um, students in college, you know, like even older people, and I can see that regardless of their age, they still have that um, paradigm of security as militarized. Like, I don't think we are doing enough to basically spread the message of what uh, human security is, that there are several dimensions and that security means everything for you know each individual and that we should stop thinking about security in terms of weapons and who's the strongest and who again you you also mentioned how do we move away from you know the military complexes and you know the the whole military industry i think we also should be paying attention on the little ones because they are the ones growing up normalizing that type of violence the way we explain war to them you know, in terms of saying it is to prevent something worse from happening. You know, I think it may be too idealistic, idealistic for some, but I definitely think we have to emphasize this with children that the war is never an option. You mentioned that. And I think that will also lead us into the conversation of explaining what human security is. And then from then connect to everyone's needs in a way that can create a space to engage in dialogue. So thank you very much for sharing, you know, um, those thoughts. And I do have a question. Uh, it's in terms of UN Resolution 1325. You know, there are the three pillars of participation, protection, prevention. And we've had seven sessions of Women, Peace and Security uh, so far. And 
part of the learning has been that we are not doing also enough to ensure the equal participation of women and making sure that when they participate, they do it in a meaningful way. Um, but we've also run into a shared challenge, which is protection. How can we protect all the women working for peace building, you know, in such difficult context? So I'm not sure if you have any insights or, or some words that you can share with us that work, you know, in peace building programming on how we can uh, do a better job in protecting the women uh, peace builders. Thank you. Oh, Maria, I loved everything that you said, and I am in total agreement with you. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I think about um, the work that we have done to try to meet the North Korean women. You can imagine how impossible it is to actually meet North Korean women. And the 2015 crossing seems like a dream to me because the conditions are so much worse today than they are then. You know, you think about the US-China tensions, think about uh, Trump put in a travel ban on Americans. So I can't even go to North Korea again to, to meet unless I get some kind of special validation passport, which they denied. Um, and so, yeah, the situation is so dire. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I mean, when we tried to bring the North and the South Korean women together in Bali at one of the pictures, you know, we succeeded in bringing six North Korean women out. Three had never left the country. They had just gotten a passport for the first time. That was a huge feat. And uh, the South Korean women couldn't come to meet them because North Korea tested a hydrogen bomb right before. And so the president, Park Geun-hye, at that time said, no, if you go, you're going to get arrested. So, you know, the situation is uh, so dire. And um, I don't know what to say, except we do. We do have to protect. We do have to invest. And I guess, you know, for me and the young children, I mean, yes, my daughter is incredibly privileged because she lives in a home where she feels secure, where she's educated, where she sees her mother modeling um, how women should be, how we should have voice, we should have agency, we should complain, we should speak up, you know? Um, and, you know, I, you do see, I mean, she said something to me the other day is, oh, uh, she talked about masculinity. She's 10, you know, she talked about masculinity and how she doesn't like it uh, to be in a situation where masculinity is, you know, displayed. Um, and, you know, I just think, wow, you know, I don't sit down and talk to her about masculinity and femininity and how actually everybody should embody these qualities as we seek to achieve and realize gender equality. But somehow it has managed to be absorbed. And so how do we more um, systematically provide this kind of framework and a challenge to militarism, um, you know, to really challenge militarism? Because that is the overall framework that is allowing this massive militarization. When we think that force and violence is the way to resolve conflict, that is what is the mindset that we need to take on. And so um, it's a call for all of us and so many more to actually, that's the challenge of our lifetime. And yeah, wow, I feel so uh, stimulated. I feel so appreciative to be part of this beautiful, brilliant, thought-provoking community. And I hope there will be many more opportunities to think deeply together and dream big of another world. Wow, thank you so much, Christine. Thank you for those words. I'm going to turn it over to Raja now just to give closing comments. You have you've set us off beautifully with those final comments. Thank you, Raja. Thank you very much, Christina, for <clears throat> joining us for this inspiring words and for your inspiring action. We really appreciate having you as one of the women peace builder and women peace leaders around the world. And we are looking forward to our next events on November 10, 
10th with also another Women Beast Leaders from Sri Lanka and on December 1st with the Women Beast Leaders from Afghanistan. So I hope everyone on the call to join us to continue the conversation. And we agree with you, Christina, we need to meet in person, call for an urgent strategic planning all together. So let's let's make sure that we are working on that together. And this is like on a good note. So thank you for all the partners on this from the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies for the Seton Hall University and Inclusive Security and UNA USA. We really appreciate all the efforts and first and foremost, thank you so much, Christina, for being here and Fredlin, great moderation. We really appreciate it.